Yay, we're all back. There's everybody. Georgia, I'm going to make you an on-air sign for your office. I know. <laughs> you totally skipped mine. There's, we talked about this, right? The other challenges of doing this at in the middle of the day. <laughs> Yay. And Wednesday, apparently. And Wednesday. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, I am your co-host, Nicole Gallucci, postdoc with the CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project. Uh, and I have my co-host through the wall, <laughs> Richard Bracey. Um, Literally, right. through this wall. I know that surprised some of you guys a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, we are still working out the the uh, chinks in the new earlier time, although this is much better for our European colleagues and audience. Um, that's the day they collect garbage and vacuum the offices. <laughs> So our really awesome, awesome janitor uh, just came by and we were like, ah, we're about to go live. Um, so, yeah, all the silly. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, this isn't our first show since the Hangoutathon, is it? No, because no. you hosted the last one. That's why I'm confused. Sort um, of, yeah. Thank you again, everyone who participated in the Hangoutathon. Uh, we're still in our 36-day-long fundraiser to keep all the cool uh, citizen science and astronomy education and outreach efforts going with CosmoQuest. Um, so check out uh, cosmoquest.org slash hangoutathon. Go there. You can donate. You can share the link. You can get, um, I think you can link to the videos, but also our friend Guido Bieber, who's watching now from the other side of the pond. Hello, Guido. Uh, put up a, a uh, gosh, a directory of all the segments from the Hangoutathon with links to the direct timestamp on the YouTube video for each segment, which really is so That's awesome. Amazing. So you can go back and watch any wow, segment you want without having to go through eight hours of video to find it. <laughs> so thank you, Guido. Uh, and we also have Nancy Garziano watching. Hi, Nancy, who, um, Hi, Nancy. in addition to buying us pizza, like, from Jersey, she ordered us pizza in Illinois. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Uh, kept us alive. <laughs> um, also, uh, reformatted the Cards Against Astronomy game. So if you go to cardsagainstastronomy.com, that'll take you to our new game site. And uh, Nancy reformatted it all. She came up with the original uh, design of the Car CosmoQuest cards and then uh, reformatted it for index cards. You can print them on index cards, which are way easier to play with than little tiny paper squares. So... <laughs> Uh, go check that out. Uh, so yeah, cardsagainstastronomy.com, which I grabbed like last year, and we're finally using it. So thank you again uh, for that, and for everybody for participating. Just want to say all that stuff. Um, I forgot a demo because. <laughs> no, I I did too. I was thinking about it, and then I. I can show you my duct tape wallet. That uh, if you want a demo, go to the Hangoutathon Index. One of the first segments is we made duct tape wallets out of Galaxy duct tape. Um, yeah, so cool. Lin okay, by we I mean Lindsay showed us how to make tiny intern Lindsay uh, showed us how to make Galaxy wallets out of duct tape, and mine's a little sad and has problems <laughs> and sticky in places it's not supposed to be, but that's fine. Did you make that, or did she make that for you? Oh no, this is the one I made. You made, okay. And I kept cutting the the pieces of duct tape wrong, and so I kept sticking them on her shirt. I was just amazed by the galaxy duct tape. That's yes, so there's galaxy duct tape. We started it before. Oh, look you've got that. a thing. What's that? This is the sun. This is the sun at one ten billion to the actual size. Ooh, what is that made of? The sun. This is just a styrofoam ball. Nice. Um, that I spray painted. Um, <laughs> but the key question is, how big is Earth in comparison? Yeah. So I don't know if you can see it. Let's see if I can get that up to the camera. See that little <laughs> piece of tape and that little circle? Yeah. Yeah. The circle is not the Earth. <laughs> that little dot down in the very center of the circle is a ball bearing oh, that wow. is the size of Earth. Nice. On this scale. That's and about how far away does that ball bearing have to be? It should be 15 meters away. So this is the this is the 1 to 10 billion scale that we use for the Voyage Scale Model Solar System, which is in uh, D.C. on the mall, and also in Houston and Kansas City and Corpus Christi so far. And they'll be available to cities everywhere um, very soon. Awesome. 
an incredible price. Jeff Goldstein, the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, has been running the Voyage Project, and they've been $250,000 for an exhibit, oh. and has managed to reduce the price to $25,000. Nice. For permanent installation with educational materials outdoors. Um, so, should be pretty cool. That's awesome. So there's your demo, guys. <laughs> 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 I'll uh, let me my son with me. <laughs> That's awesome. If um if there's a website we can link to that, we'd like to add that to the Pinterest. So we have a Pinterest board started for uh you know makeable spacey craft things or educational activities. The um the website for Voyage is voyagesolarsystem.org. Okay. And that's where you'll find the info when it goes up about the new um, low-cost models that you can get installed. Awesome. And it has, you know, tours and stuff. I do have a set of activities already written that um, go along with this and, and so on. But I, I don't remember the link offhand. I'll have to send okay. that to you later. Yeah, send that, and we'll add that to the Pinterest board. So, yeah, all the, all the good hands-on stuff. Uh, we're trying to actually collect through Pinterest board, and, we're, and so there's a new post on Educator Zone about that. So check that out on CosmoQuest. Let me formally welcome our guest. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> you caught us in the ramble mode. Uh, this is Jeffrey Bennett, astronomer and author, and he writes awesome textbooks and awesome children's books and awesome books for adults and uh, is the founder of Big Kids Science at uh, BigKidsScience.com. Um, so that's the, um, the, you guys have a Google Plus page, which is what you're calling us from, and that's the website link I'll share out as well. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Yeah, Thank welcome. You. Yeah, so um, what do you want to talk about first? I think, I mean, I, we've talked about the, um, we did an episode way back in the beginning where we just briefly talked about our favorite science, our favorite kids science, specifically science book. astronomy books, um, and the Max books were, were right up there, and we had copies, and they, probably at Pamela's house at this point, I don't know where they are, but you've got your copies right there. I have them all here. Yay! So these okay. are Max Goes to Blank. Yeah. He's so been to the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and the space moon, station. Mars, <laughs> and Jupiter so far. So who is Max? Tell us Max, who is Max. Max is the guy on the cover. That's, that's <laughs> our dog. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, I... So just uh, very briefly there, I... Um, Back in the uh, early part of my career, I taught elementary school and mm -hmm. always wanted to write books for kids. And it took me more than 20 years to realize that a good way to connect with kids would be through a dog. I don't know why it took me so long, but um, but that's what happened. So eventually I realized the dog would, would help the storyline. And Max is based on a real dog. And Max is based on our real dog. So... Mm -hmm. So I always explain to the kids, all the things that he does in the books, he really does on Earth. We've just transported them into how it would unfold in space. And in fact, all the paintings, the artists um, have two different artists on those books. All the paintings are actually painted from real photos of Max doing his various things and the spacesuits and so on are, are added on. Um, yeah, I love the pictures of him in his spacesuit, his... Don yeah, that, uh, really just an, <laughs> one of my favorite examples of that, let me grab it real quick, is this yeah. particular painting. I try to imagine my cat in a spacesuit, and it just is <laughs> more hilarious. Oh. This particular <laughs> painting, and Max goes to the moon. Yes. Isn't that okay? Yeah, Where awesome. he's leaping out, and he's got that astonished look on his face because <laughs> he's going so much higher and farther than he expected. And this was based on a photo of Max going off a diving board into a swimming pool. Oh, my God. <laughs> So that is the look that was on his face for real. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So he's an adventurous dog in real life also. Yes, that was our first Max. He was very adventurous. Our current dog, who we call oh. Cosmo, who plays Max in the stories, is uh, much, much lazier. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so can you tell us a little bit about um, this, this Max series, as well as you have a new book. It looks like The Wizard Who Saved the World. Um, they're children's books that are fun and scientifically accurate. So tell us a little bit about that philosophy. Well, the philosophy was um, that 
I want kids to learn science and get excited about science. And what had always bothered me when I was teaching elementary school about the science books that were out there for kids is that most of them, even though a lot of them were really well done, they were just plain nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So you had all these kids who thought space was really cool and they'd pick them up and read them, but the rest of the kids wouldn't necessarily pay attention. So I wanted to make sure that there was an actual storyline so that somebody might pick it up even if they didn't think they cared about space and science and hopefully along the way I could convert them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where Max comes in. He forms the storyline because um, you know, even if the kids don't realize they're learning any science and it works even down to like age three and so on, they'll relate to the dog and, and the picture. Right. And then as they get older, they can start to understand. So when I write the books, um, I actually first outline the science concepts that I want to do. And, um, and then the science concepts I build into the story, so something's happening here, they're seeing the uh, scene from Apollo 11, but then over on the side of the page, it explains in more detail what's going on scientifically in the story so that they can learn more about that as they get older. And also so that parents, if they're reading to younger kids and the kids ask a question, most of the time the parents will find the answer on the side of the page there. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's perfect. Right. <laughs> I think we adopted that when we did the, the little booklet from Dark Skies Bright Kids. Um, there's a back section that has more information. We specifically had parents and educators in mind, so I think right. we got that idea. You're going to get the questions. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, Guido Bieber asks, Jeff, the, the idea of a space-traveling dog may be influenced a little by the Soviet space dogs? Um, you know, not so much directly, um, but certainly that's something that kids get very interested in, has there really been dogs in space. And actually, you know, one of the things that's very interesting, um, when I go to do my school presentations, I can do any of the books, but with the younger kids, I pretty much always do Max Goes to the Moon because I have a few more activities that go with it. And so I'll always start out by asking the kids, you know, after I show them the cover, is this a true story? Yeah. And it's very interesting that, like kindergarten and first grade, about half the kids will think it is a true story. Okay. And that's very interesting because not only does that mean they think that my dog went to the moon, <laughs> but they also assume that people go to the moon all the time. Regularly, yeah. And and it's uh, I have to think that as they get older and realize that. We did once, but it was more than 40 years ago, and we've never gone back since, that a certain disappointment has to set in in realizing that oh, it's, definitely. we ought to be doing this all the time, so why aren't we? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, yeah, so I think that's a... Uh, do you ever get that particular question from students as well? So some of them that realize that, oh, hey, we're really not doing that now. Oh, that comes up all the time. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of Max Goes to the Moon, I talk about uh, building the big moon. They build the big moon colony, and it includes, of course, the University of the Moon. And if I then ask the kids how many of them want to go to college on the moon, yes. almost every hand <laughs> goes up, right? So they, they see that as something that ought to be real and ought to be available, and hopefully that will help push things in the right direction in the future. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, just a quick comment. We're getting some comments uh, from the Q&A app that people are having trouble connecting, uh, so their comments may be a little behind. <laughs> so if, com if we get comments a few minutes later, I may still bring them up. Um, so sorry, guys. If you're having a bit of lag problems, eee, sorry. Um, but uh, we have a couple people who are hanging in there. So, okay. So back to topic. Um, what? Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the activities that go along with the books. Well, I, at the end of the books, I always try to put in um, an activity. Um, I save the last two pages before the final closing mm -hmm. page. But the last two pages after the story ends are for activities. So I always put in some kind of activity. And then there's usually a few other sort of active type things built into some of those big kid boxes along the sides of the pages. But that's a big area where I have a lot of activity ideas and so do a lot of other teachers mm -hmm. that can do more with it. And we're working on, as part of the story time from space program, trying to get 
more of those activities organized and posted so that people will be able to use them in their classrooms in the future. So the, I see there's an activities resources part of the website. Is there a way for people who have activity ideas to send them to you or? Um, send them to me, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, email, just send, send me an email and um, We'll, uh, we'll figure out some way to get them posted. And I'm working on, on trying to get more of that um, capability built in. But for now, if you send me an email, we will find a way to get the activities posted, probably with the new story time from Space Program, because that's where the focus for all the activities will be. OK, so what story time from Space? Yeah, that was happening earlier. So it kind of boggles my mind still that this happened to me. but. Um, about four years ago, I was sitting right exactly here, and my phone, I have to tell you, I do keep a phone, a landline, because just in case somebody wants to do a radio interview, which happens about twice a year, it's not like a common thing. But other than that, my phone never rings, unless it's a solicitor who I'm going to end up hanging up on. Um, <laughs> the phone rings one day, and this woman says, I'm Patricia Tribe, and I'm here with astronaut Alvin Drew, and uh, we're wondering if it's okay to take your book up to the, on the space shuttle. Mm. And I'm like, who's this again? Because <laughs> I, I just I thought I was playing, playing a joke on me. But as it turned out, um, Patricia had been the uh, director of uh, education for Space Center Houston for a long time. And Alvin Drew is an astronaut. And uh, actually, people, when they say they recognize him, it's usually not from being an astronaut. But he is the guy who's in the Air Force commercial that airs like during the Super Bowl, before movies that are playing in the theater, and uh, everything else. So he's pretty well known for that. And um, amazing person. And anyway, they had decided that a good way to connect literacy and science would be to have astronauts read from space. So cool. And they were familiar with Max Goes to the Moon, and they thought that would be a good choice. And so they were calling me to ask permission to do it and to get the electronic file because for that particular um, mission, Alvin could not take up a physical book because of, you know, a pound is a lot of... Yeah, that's amazing too. Wow. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, he read it from the um, final mission of the Discovery in 2011. The video is posted on the Big Kid Science site. If you click through, it's on YouTube also. You can find it. Alvin Drew reads Max Goes to the Moon. And then uh, people liked the idea enough that uh, Patricia kept uh, pushing it, and she managed to get NASA and CASIS, which is the organization that handles all research and activity on the space station for the United States now. Mm. And they're kind of equivalent of a U.S. national lab for the space station. And so they decided they wanted to send physical books up and continue this program as a story time from space. I got the little logo out. Awesome. There. And they, uh, they decided that they liked my books and wanted to send them up, but that since I had, at the time, Max Goes to the Moon, Mars, and Jupiter, they asked me if I'd write Max Goes to the Space Station. And I can tell you a cute little story there, which is, in Max Goes to the Moon, at the beginning of the story, it says that there's, they're holding a parade for Max because he was a hero on the space station. And that's how it leads into him getting chosen to go to the moon. Oh. Now, of course, I put that in there as a plot device because why would they pick my dog to go to the moon, right? So the plot device was, well, he's already a hero because he's been to the space station. But I didn't, I hadn't written that book, so I didn't it's have to. Flashback. Point. Right. <laughs> and I also kind of had it in my mind that eventually I might want to write that book because weightlessness, as you know, is one of the more difficult concepts to explain to kids and, and teachers. And there was no place to explain it in going to Moon, Mars, and Jupiter because you're going to have weight when you're walking around these places. So I thought I might do that. But um, So after Alvin read the book from Discovery, we had dinner together. That was the first time I ever met him. And... Um, he said to me, so what did Max do on the space station <laughs> to be a hero? <laughs> and I said, gosh, Alvin, I really don't know. Do you have any ideas? And uh, he said, yes, I have just the idea for you. And oh. so he gave me the idea for the storyline, which in Max goes to the space station, the, the key part when Max becomes a hero is due to a leak in the ammonia cooling system. 
And uh, then the very interesting part, I guess I can show you pictures so you're not just looking at me. Um, here's, uh, uh, wait, wrong book. <laughs> That's why I'm not finding it. Um, <laughs> so there's the page where uh, Max um, sniffs out the ammonia leak before any of the astronauts. <gasps> And then to repair that, they have to do an EVA. So they go out of the EVA to repair it. Wow. And the really uh, interesting thing that then happened was they got the five, I wrote that book, the five books were all picked to be the first set launched to the space station. The launch was scheduled this past December. And just as they were about to go, there was a leak in the ammonia cooling system. Oh my God. <laughs> And the astronauts had to go out on EVA to do the repair, and as a result of that, they had to delay the launch because it's a cargo launch, and they can't deal with cargo coming in at the same time that they're dealing with a, an EVA. So it was kind of interesting that it turned out that way. <laughs> and then Mike Hopkins, the astronaut who, uh, one of the two astronauts who went out on that EVA, was the one who read the book from space. And um, that video is actually already posted on the storytimefromspace.com website. And so anyway, that's what Storytime from Space is. It's the idea of having the astronauts read these books from space. So those five books are up there orbiting Earth right now, 17,000 miles an hour. Um, they're still up there even though they've read all five in English. The Japanese astronaut who's up there right now is planning to read in Japanese. We sent him translations. Oh, cool. and, uh, we actually also sent up translations for the cosmonauts in Russian in case they want to read. They, they read the translation from the electronic while they hold the English book with the pictures. Um, of course, as everyone knows, uh, at the moment, having the Russians do anything with American books is a little bit tricky. Oh, my God. I, I but hopefully that'll, mm. hopefully that'll clear up and they'll be able to read in Russian <laughs> as well. I just, I just saw a news story today where there's... Um, some, you know, tension because NASA really wants to use Russian rock and parts. <laughs> the U.S. really right. wants to continue to work with the Russians. The Russians right. continue, yeah. It's amazing uh, how many problems p politicians can cause for all the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so story time from space is that idea of reading the books from space. There's also a set of science demos that um, have been designed to be launched also. They'll be launched later this year. And the astronauts will do these demos to... Um, kind of complement some of the science activities in the book. And it's, out, it's a very interesting thing. You know, the astronauts have for a long time done stuff like that just with the materials they have available on orbit. So you may remember Chris Hadfield last year doing the washcloth one that got a lot of YouTube hits. It's really cool. And they send up student space flight experiments, which is a program where students design experiments and they send them up. But no one's ever said, let's just design educational demonstrations and send those up. Mm -hmm. and of course, you can see the potential in that for education. So that's also part of the story time from space program. So the plan is for it to continue going on. The, like I said, the storytimefromspace.com website has just gone live recently. They're, they're starting a Kickstarter campaign so people can go to the web website and learn how to contribute and get cool perks and stuff like that. Very cool. Yep, so there's the video. Yeah. So we, we don't have the ability to play video through here because you lose the sound, but um, <clears throat> definitely, yeah, right on the front page. Uh, yeah, see, the first blog was May 4th, so it's a really new site. <laughs> um, but there's the, uh, there's the story, the video of the story being read, so you go check that out after the show. Um, you have a donate link up already, and then there's the Kickstarter campaign, so we'll definitely look for that. Thanks. 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 Awesome, awesome. Now, do the ast astronauts do any, like, discussion or beyond just reading the book? Do they talk about maybe their experiences, like you mentioned, with the leak and, you know, that might relate to the book, anything else? You know, so, so you, we only can send up fairly limited instructions, and we told them to feel free to ad-lib as much as they want. Yeah. Um, and uh, Mike Hopkins did a, did a fair amount of that in his readings. I think... Um, but there's more that we could say related to things like that. So that'll be the post-editing process. So the reason, the reason the program is looking for funding is because you know, the launch is all covered by, by NASA, and the astronaut time is all built in there. But in order to do all the post-production work on the videos, to put all the curriculum materials up, get them developed, 
Right. Um, that's where they're hoping to get some some funding. To oh, do. we know that well. <laughs> I just read the word about it, as you know. So yeah, it's always a a tricky thing, but but at least in this case, um, it's happening no matter what. That's great. Yeah. Question: How much can be done with it? Cool. Great. We have great. a question from uh, Guido Bibra. <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> Nicole and Georgia will expect me to ask this question. Are there any German translations of the books in the work? Having Alexander Gerst, who is going up to the station, station soon, read the books in his native language would be amazing. Um, that is a very good question, um, which I appreciate very much. So there is, um, we do not have it in the works yet, but we are aware of the languages being spoken by some of the astronauts who are going up. The key question is when do the books come back down? Okay. Um, and so we're still trying to figure that out. Um, we've said we're happy to leave them up there for as long as they want and get them read in as many languages as possible. But um, space is at a premium in yeah. space. <laughs> Irony! <laughs> Storage space is at a premium in real space. <laughs> and uh, so whether we can keep them up there long enough for, for uh, the other astronauts who are going up later to read them is still to be determined. But if they are still up there, then yes, hopefully that will happen. Awesome, awesome, cool, right. very cool. Um, so since we mentioned this, uh, it, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but we did get a question uh, that said, how much question mark, which I think is in, in reference to the Voyage Solar System. Can you talk a little bit about the Voyage Solar System project? And I'll share the, the link out while you do that. Sure. So Voyage is a 1 to 10 billion scale model of the solar system. So on that scale, you know, we have our sun is this big, the Earth, that tiny dot, 15 meters away. So what you have for the installation, and you can see the pictures on that website, is there's a series of pedestals. Um, this one, the sun, is just out there like this. All the planets are obviously too small, so they're encased in glass. So you walk mm -hmm. up and you see a little glass disc that has the planets. In fact, I'm not walking away from you, but... <laughs> This, I don't know, I, I doubt if this will show up well, but what that is, is that is the outline of the sun is going along there, and that's wow. all the planets and their moons on that scale from Voyage. This is a crystal of the Voyage project. Ooh. And so you walk along, and you encounter the planets as you go, and it's about 600 meters out to Pluto, and we do have Pluto in there. Um, it was in the original because it was still a planet then, and then people left such nice uh, little things about uh, Pluto's demise. There were all kinds of memorials that people just spied yeah. in 2006. So we've left it out there, and it's a good marker. Um, and so the exhibit is, that's basically what it looks like. It's a permanent installation. It should last, you know, many, 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 many years because it's designed for outdoors. Mm -hmm. And it's $25,000. Uh, is, is what the price is going to be. It includes those plaques that you see there on the screen with information about each object. And it just really gives you a great sense of what the scale of space really is. And in fact, uh, what really helped me to understand this well was the first one that we built was at the University of Colorado. Um, and that was installed in 1987. And after we got it built, we started taking some of our astronomy colleagues, right, who were in town visiting. So these are professional astronomers, and we'd start taking them on tours of this exhibit. And as they'd walk along, they'd see how tiny the planets were, and they'd go, that can't be right. And then they'd do the calculation in their heads, and they'd go, oh, wait, it is. And so you see, even people who've been studying this all their lives, it's still shocking when you walk through it and see what the scale of space really looks like. And then, of course, the most astonishing thing is when you walk your 600 meters to Pluto, you know, if depending on how long you stopped at each one along the way, it's taken you five to ten minutes. You know, the next question that you always, people are always wondering is, when, when will I get to Alpha Centauri where I'll find the next ball this side? <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I like about this one to ten billion scale, we chose the scale for a number of reasons. One is that um, it makes the math really easy. So even upper elementary, upper elementary school kids can do the conversions between real 
and scale things. Also because, you know, with the solar system on this scale, it's 600 meters to Pluto. If you change the scale so the planets are a little bigger, then it becomes a really long walk. If you change the scale so that um, it's a shorter walk, the planets become so tiny you can't see them anymore. So it's a nice scale for that purpose, but the really cool thing is just by sheer coincidence, it turns out that a light year is right about 10 to the 12 kilometers. So that means on this scale, it becomes, um, I assume 10 to the 13th kilometers. So on this scale, it becomes a thousand kilometers. Oh. So four light years to Alpha Centauri is 4,000 kilometers. It's the distance across the United States. Good luck so walking walk, that. Walk to Pluto in five minutes, but you'd have to cross the United States. A long way <laughs> to Alpha Centauri. And there's all kinds of great educational lessons you can do from from all of these things. So that's what the exhibit is, and uh, the, our goal is to get them in a hundred different communities around the world. Again, uh, that VoyageSolutions.org that you showed, Jeff Goltz, you know, have a formal announcement out soon, and. Uh, you know, then communities can put in their proposals. And he'll even help fundraise for you cool. if you put in a proposal that shows you're really serious about making good use of it. Wow. I see there's one in, I, um, I haven't actually been to the DC one, um, but I see there's one in Kansas City, and I'm going there for a Maker Fair soon. Oh, cool. Uh, Union Station, so I'm going to have to go. I've not seen that one myself either, so, um, okay. but, yep, should be not too hard to find. And the one that you see is right outside the Air and Space Museum, so it's easy. Okay. I'm usually bolting right inside, so <laughs> I'm like, I want to go see the cool things. Yeah. I want to go see the, the rockets. But yeah. yeah. Um, I have a friend who works there now. We should go visit her. Uh, <laughs> um, who actually is another UVA grad, so. <laughs> yes. uh, we have a question from Nancy Graziano. What is Max's next destination? <laughs> mm, I'm you know, that's a really good question. I have not started on another um, one yet. I'm going to do an update to Max Goes to Mars, mm. I think, because remarkably, um, after 10 years, I'm finally almost out of copies. So since I have to, have to uh, reprint anyway, I figured I would update for curiosity and so on. So that'll be for uh, six, six months from now. And uh, then I'm not sure. I'm kind of waiting to see how things go with story time from space, whether people, you know, want more. And if so, probably Saturn, because there's so much great Cassini stuff yeah. that can be put yeah. into the story. Yeah. Um, so tell us how you got started, uh, maybe interested in writing and in science. I know you probably get asked that a lot, but that's always interesting to me. Um, well, you know, I, I was uh, in, what, fourth grade or so when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. And I think uh, everybody my age... That was enough, yeah. Things, and, and it had just such a tremendous impact on me. And I, of course, you know, go, the fact that that was coming was part of my entire childhood. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I was always very, very interested in space and science. And then, um, but strangely enough, I got slightly off the track. In undergrad, I majored in biophysics, and I was just about to go to grad school in biophysics when the original Cosmos came on TV. Ooh. All right. And I already loved teaching. I'd already been working at elementary schools and so on. And I saw that show with Carl Sagan, and it was just like, I need to do that. <laughs> And uh, so that is uh, how I switched over into astrophysics. And, and I especially, I really love the fact that it's being redone now with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I hope everybody's watching it because it is so good. Um, I love it. Yeah, I know. That show had a huge, the original had a huge impact on me too. And I know there's, there's many people, you know, the same uh, mind and it just had a big impact and it can change your direction like you say, and what you want to do and where you end up. So it is amazing. Yeah. Like the Apollo era, you know, it really can make an impact. So, yeah. And so, and then you, then you went into teaching for a little yeah, bit. I went into teaching. And um, so when I started teaching at the college level, um, you know, I wasn't super satisfied with the textbooks that were available to me at the time. So I was writing my own notes 
and also I had a math course that I was developing for which I was writing my own notes. And apparently I didn't know it when I was doing those notes, but um, once your notes get thick enough, publishers start knocking on your door. <laughs> and uh, that's how I ended up writing textbooks. Right, so the textbooks came came from that out of my teaching, and then after my, my very dog-eared fifth yeah. edition, oh, you're in seventh edition now. See, yeah. Uh, so this is the textbook we all used at university. Seventh, seventh edition now. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, I like the cover. University of Virginia um, for teaching, which is why it's so dog-eared. Because although I didn't teach one hundred and one, I tutored all the sections of <laughs> astronomy 101. Um, and even after we went through a review of all the different textbooks out there, I think this one still got voted up the favorite. I think this has some water damage. It's... <laughs> Put that away now. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we all loved, loved your textbook because it, it's, it's about what we know and it's about how we know it. Uh, had really good, concise illustrations, stuff like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, and that's maybe that's a good point for me to explain. I took that off my tagline because I thought it was confusing there. But the tagline we use for big kids science is education, perspective, and inspiration. Mm -hmm. And part of my belief about the education system is that you can't succeed unless you have those three things together. But 90% of the time, people teach with only the first part, the education. And by that, I mean the educational content. They say, here's what we want the students to know. Um, and then they try to deliver it. But unless you deliver it with perspective, and by that, I mean telling the kids how what they learn is going to affect the way they view themselves as a human being or their planet and so on, why should they learn about it? And plus, you also want to inspire them because without the inspiration, they're not going to be motivated to learn. And you also want them to take what they learn and do something useful with it as they grow up. And we need, so I think we need all three components. And uh, the reason my textbook is called The Cosmic Perspective is, is exactly that. And I've tried to do the same thing with the kids' books, but I think a lot of our educational system always just focuses on if we just tell the students what they need to know and say it clearly, they'll absorb it. But but they won't unless you've given them these other reasons. No. Yeah, we, we had a whole episode about the deficit model in education. If you just give people the facts, they will <laughs> learn it. And that's, you know, you're filling in that deficit. No, that doesn't quite work that way. So we, right. we kind of dissected that in a, in a previous episode. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently wrapping my brain around all of that now. <laughs> Yes, it's sadly, I guess, sadly, much more complicated than that. But then when I was teaching, too, I always thought, so the fun part for teaching for me was not the content itself and just sort of straight delivery of content, like you said, but trying to figure out how to make the connections from the content to the student to the greater world, so that perspective part, and then how to make it fun how, you know, so inspiring, and that is really where teaching, I think, gets fun. So, right. you know, just to sit there and deliver content is kind of ho-hum, but it's, you know, bringing in books and stories and people and, and making a real huge, you know, project unit out of it. That's the that's right. great part. So, yeah, I agree totally. That's that's how it ought to be. Yeah, and it's, it's tricky. More fun for teachers, too, not just for students. It's more right. fun for teachers. That's, that's, fun. that's fun for teachers, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, now with all the standardized tests and so on, which, which I support the standardized testing. I think it's important to have it. But, but it kind of has swung so far towards it that teachers feel like they have to just deliver that content that's on the test and they don't do all that other fun stuff anymore. Yeah, and then it's too much pressure. About it. Yeah, it's too much pressure. Yeah. Great, great. You said something um, that kind of stuck with me. I don't remember. I, it must have been like one of my first couple years of grad school, and, and we were doing a seminar on education, and you came to speak, and uh, you said your Astronomy 101 students are smarter than you think they are, but no less astronomy than you think they do. And I think that is like that is one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten for teaching astronomy. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, those are what I call. I used to call them my two laws. And I had to change it to two guideposts, but it's my two guideposts <laughs> for teaching anything. Always assume that your audience knows less than you might expect them to know, but also assume that they're more intelligent 
than you might <laughs> expect them to be. And that way you're always remembering to review things because mm -hmm. they, it might not actually be review, but at the same time, you're challenging them because you're not assuming that they're not smart enough to learn really tough stuff. Right, right. And that, that works with kids, too. I'm so many people. It's, it's, it works at scientific conferences. You, you know, I think if you think of when you go to a AAS meeting and you see people yeah. giving 15-minute talks, you know, the, if, if all they do is assume you know everything they do, it's not much use, you know, mm -hmm. to you at all because you're not the specialist in there. Yeah. And it's when they remember that you don't know as much about their specialty as they might wish you did. Right. That's when they can talk to you at a level that comes across really well and makes it useful to you. Unfortunately, if you have a five-minute talk, <laughs> then it's even tougher. <laughs> There's no. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they give the the people who are doing their dissertations a whole fifteen minutes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That is always good. Um, so you have, you have some uh, books for grown-ups, or I still consider them big kids, us big kids. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we have a comment from Richard Drum over on the event page. So Richard Drum uh, is also a Charlottesville, he's a Charlottesville amateur astronomer in Charlottesville, um, who does our, all of our audio processing for 365 Days of Astronomy. Thank you, Richard. Um, mm -hmm. He commented briefly, I met Jeff when he came to Charlottesville a few years ago. I'm finally getting around to the Beyond the UFOs book he has signed for me. So, yay! He's got a backlog. He's finally catching up. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your, your, your books for grown-ups? Sure. Um, I wrote one back in 2000, but that one's out of print, so I, I won't show you that. But... Um... The, uh, the more recent ones are the, the Beyond UFOs, which is uh, that. So this is, um, this is, so as you know, Nicole, since you've used it, I have a textbook on life in the universe, astrobiology. And when I was writing that textbook, it was, I didn't know all that much about astrobiology before I got asked to write that book. Luckily, they teamed me up with experts like Sesh Sostak and right, that's right, yeah. Nasty, who did. And when I was writing the book, I thought, this is the one I taught with. <laughs> yeah. This is so cool. What about people who aren't going to take a whole semester long course? I know. So I decided to write this book as sort of the uh, two hour version, uh -huh. or three hours, whatever it takes you to you know, read a couple hundred pages of um, just what's so important about astrobiology and why it's not just important science, but important as something for the human race because I think you know towards the end when you get to Fermi's paradox you know where is everybody why have we not actually made contact um, you get some really interesting uh, philosophical implications out of that and there's also some really fun stuff that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the model solar system for example um, you know I have a chapter called uh, what I know about aliens and, and what I know about aliens who are visiting us Yeah. Some people think they are, and that's where the title of the book, Beyond UFOs, comes from. What's, by the way, what's Beyond UFOs? Beyond UFOs is science, <laughs> um, yes. where you can actually yes. learn something real about the possibility of, of the uh, extraterrestrial life. But uh, what I know about aliens who might be visiting us is that if they really are visiting us, and they might be, um, they're, they're so far ahead of us that, as Arthur C. Clarke put it, um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from, indistinguishable from magic. And you can see that when you realize that they're coming, you know, on this scale from across the United States when we have gone from here, Earth, a little dot here, to the moon. This is the distance between the Earth and the moon on that scale. Um, that just tells you they're just a lot, lot more advanced than we are. So you can get all kinds of interesting stuff. And then I had two books more recently, um, Math for Life, which is why basically uh, my book about math education, but also talks about a lot of real life math stuff and why no one should ever, ever, ever again say that they're bad at math. <laughs> uh, because it's a social disease, mm. saying of that. And when one adult says it, you know, 10 kids get infected with it and think it's okay. Uh, so don't ever say it. And then this one just came out a month or so ago, What is Relativity? And uh, I just loved relativity, and so I wanted to try to write a book that would 
hopefully bring it down to a level where people who didn't have much physics background or any relativity background could could understand it. There's a lot of really good relativity books out there, um, but I found they're always a little higher level than what most people can get. I was sort of aiming for uh, smart middle and high school kids mm -hmm. here. Um, so hopefully that makes it accessible to lots right, of people. Can you talk a little bit about, I know um, when you taught math at the college level, you decided that, uh, we, you know, we all tend to teach algebras that basic math everyone has to pass, um, and that, that may not be the most useful type of math. Can you talk a little bit about your, your quantitative reasoning sort of course? Yeah, so quantitative reasoning is, is uh, basically the term that goes to how we use math in sort of everyday types of reasoning situations. So things like taxes, energy, um, population, uh, the housing bubble, all that kind of stuff. We're just thinking about big numbers, you know, and thinking about the statistics you read in the newspaper. So all those kinds of things. And it wasn't actually my idea. It was the University of Colorado had decided that that was what they thought everyone graduating from college should know. That, that was more important than algebra yeah. to know. That algebra was important if you were going to use it, you know, go on to calculus and so on. But otherwise, you needed to know all these other things, and it wasn't being taught. So I was very fortunate that they picked me um, at the time to uh, help advise them on how to develop that curriculum and then to, to start teaching the course. And that's how my first textbook came about, because it was, as far as I know, the first course of its type in the country. And so I had the first set of notes, so it worked out, <laughs> worked out nicely. And, um, but that's exactly what it is. It's, you know, for students who are not going to move on to calculus, you have to ask yourselves, what should we teach them? Mm -hmm. And you have relatively limited options. One option is, and the most common option even today, is college algebra. Mm -hmm. And I met an algebra textbook author one time who said people always ask him, what's the difference between high school algebra and college algebra? And he said, oh, that's easy. College algebra is where we teach you the same things that we taught you in high school algebra, only this time we teach them to you louder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think That's that really true. Happens, right? I mean, at any, at any major university in the country, you don't even get there unless you already passed high school algebra. Yeah. So what's the point in making you do it all over again in college? If you got it, then you already know it. If you didn't get it, hearing it louder is probably not going to change things. So what can we teach you that's actually going to help you in your other classes, in your career, and in your life? And that's what quantitative reasoning is. And Math for Life is my book for the public where I try to kind of explain all that, make the case, talk about what I think should be done in mathematics education and, and so on. Yeah, you're talking about real like mathematic literacy, right, instead of... Right. Just, you know, and it's, numeracy, maybe, I've heard it too, yeah, instead of just... context yeah. idea, again, yeah. you know, one very simple example is, um, if you think about, for example, the uh, mortgages, and mm -hmm. in typical math curricula, you learn about the exponential function, and if you're lucky and your teacher doesn't run out of time, sometime near the end, they explain to you how you can derive the mortgage interest formula from that and what a mortgage is, and that's probably as far as they'll ever get. But for ordinary people, what's important there is understanding that formula, what it tells you about your principal and your interest payments, and how you're going to make a decision about what level of mortgage you can afford and what type of mortgage you should get. And so if you teach that context first, then sometime later you can say, oh, by the way, that remember that form, formula we use for mortgage interest? It's actually part of the general exponential formula. And now you've got the student's attention because you've already explained to them why the general exponential formula is useful. Yeah. And now they might learn it in a more general way. Whereas when you do it the reverse, most likely their brain's turned off before they ever got oh, yes. the sort of interest. Yeah, I don't see any connection. Start with the context. Yeah. Yeah, I spent four years tutoring college algebra when I was in college, and it was it was hard because the students would struggle, and the inevitable question of when am I ever going to use this, and there's sometimes it's like, you know, you're factoring a polynomial going, you know what, you won't. <laughs> 
you know, I would try, I would try and encourage them by saying you're, you're, you're doing problem solving, you're training your brain for problem solving, and it's an exercise. But the content itself was just never going to come yeah. up. Yeah, that's that's really that's a very important point, and I think you know my my, um, what I explain in the book is I think when you're in high school, it's fine for us to force everybody to learn that stuff because we don't want to cut off their options while they're 16 years old. Right. If they decide they want to go into engineering or science of any type, they need that to move on to calculus. So, you know, as responsible adults, we need to force, you know, kids 16, 17 years old to take stuff that they might decide they actually need. But once they get to college and they're adults themselves, if they've made the decision that they're not going in that direction, yeah, then what's the point of all that stuff that they really won't use again? Yeah. Math is awesome. You need math, but not all the math. <laughs> right. You'll be able to think mathematically. Yes. Not not some of the math. Um, we have a comment from a little bit earlier I wanted to share from Sylvan Westby. Uh, There's been a planetary way near my home for as long as I can remember. The sun is five feet in diameter, so like me. Mm. <laughs> standing up. Um, so it's a long way to reach the former planet Pluto, and the next star would be several Earth diameters away. So that's a much bigger scale model solar system. Um, that Sylvan has in his right. There's a, there's a number of these around the world built at various scales, and you know they're all cool, and and I love them all. But I think when you're looking for a scale that allows you to really get that whole picture, yeah. being walkable and visible at the same time is important. And and that one to ten billion is kind of a sweet spot. Okay. For that. There's one at uh, in the at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia that is was designed so that the sun is at the, um, not quite the, at the science center, but it's at the control building. And Pluto, which at the time was the ninth planet, is at the Green Bank Telescope. So it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit bigger than the, the, the National Mall model. And you, because there's hills and windy bits, you can't see the whole thing at once. Um, but it fits for that exhibit. Right. Um, and then, of course, uh, Pluto got demoted. <laughs> and each of the stations has a flag on it. And so Pluto has the Pluto flag's been at half mast. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's like oh, oh but they, they, didn't, they keep, they're like we did this. We're not going to redesign it, so we're just no. going to put Pluto at half mast and keep going. So, yeah. yeah, I mean it's still there. Pluto it's is there. Still. It's cool. We're going to visit it in, with New Horizons next year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have comments also from Hugo Burnham. Uh, says, it's always good to listen to authors as they are so passionate about their subject. Jeff is the man who answered the question, what is relativity for me so well in his book? So, yeah. Excellent. And he right. says, remember, black holes don't suck. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I've had this argument on the Weekly Space Hangout. <laughs> black holes <laughs> don't suck. Because <laughs> everyone wants to use that analogy in science, right? You know, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, not a vacuum. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Read the book. So we won't spoil that too much more for you. Um, so I think I got to all the questions. Uh, sorry for those of you who couldn't watch because you were having stream problems. I wonder what's going on. Um, but uh, uh, this this show will be available, um, so it'll be archived right away on my YouTube page. It'll be archived soon on the Astrosphere Vids page, which is the where all the Cosmo Quest Hangouts live on YouTube, and then the audio version of this will show up at. Um, <coughs> Ooh, sorry, at uh, 365 Days of Astronomy podcast. So um, all the links we talked about will be in the show notes, and they're in the comments as they're in the comments right now. Um, let me do some quick announcements, and then we'll end. Can I just put in one last little plug here? Yes. Uh, if you don't mind. Um, I was going to let you save your plug for the end, though. Oh, okay. That's fine. That okay? Yeah, I like to end on, on a cool thing. Um, but we'll just do the boring announcements first. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, next uh, Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout at noon Pacific. Uh, all of us space geeks and journalists and people uh, will be wrapping up the week's news. Uh, that's hosted by Fraser Kane, and uh, that's also on the Cosmic West Google Plus page. Sunday night's virtual star party, it has moved back yet again to 9 p.m. Pacific. Sorry, East Coast and Central, our time zone. Uh, it's getting real late for us, but most of the astronomers are on the West Coast, so they have to wait for darkness. Uh, virtual star party, check that out. That's also hosted by Fraser Kane and Scott Lewis. Monday, uh, assuming scheduling has gone back to normal, should be a recording of Astronomy Cast with Fraser Kane and Pamela Gay, which brings us back around to next Wednesday's Learning Space. 
which means I'm going to look at the schedule again because I, I can't think of it in advance. Georgia, do you remember who our guest is next week? I don't. And I was just looking at it earlier. Uh, you can go to the Educator Zone and get the, to the Learning Space page. We have the next, like, six or seven uh, guests listed. Oh, next week we'll be talking about the Chandra X-ray Telescope blog <laughs> with Megan Watsky and Kimberly Cole Arkin. So they do a really great job blogging uh, from the Chandra Space Telescope blog so website. Uh, so we'll be talking about that next week here on Learning Space. Okay, Jeff, let's hear your... Last plug and maybe final words of inspiration for our audience. Well, uh, what I wanted to mention was that uh, you know the IPCC report has come out recently, and then on today's uh, front page of the New York Times is this uh, beautiful map of the climate change that has already occurred um, in the United States. And of course, global warming is something I've focused a lot of my efforts on. My kid's book, The Wizard Who Saved the World, is based around that. But I also spent um, several days working pretty hard on a little video to try to make global warming really clear. So I wanted to point people to that. In fact, I guess since we're on Google here, yeah. you just go to the Big Kid Science YouTube channel. You'll see it there. But you can also get to it through uh, globalwarmingprimer.com or through my Huffington Post blog page under my name. And uh, I hope people will check out that video and uh, share it with other people because I... I think it's really important to get more people understanding what this problem really is and the fact that despite all the d debate you hear, there, there really isn't any. You know, <laughs> There's no <laughs> debate on the side. Right, least. right. There's lots of debate about the politics, but Policy. the science is solid. And um, so I want to just make sure that's clear. So I hope people will watch that video. And then also please go to storytimefromspace.com and hopefully join the Kickstarter campaign. And those are my plugs. Yeah. Go to, yeah, Big Kid Science, uh, spa wait, what was the last one? I Full Time from Space.com, that's where the Kickstarter space. campaign is for that, yeah. For my books, you would go to my websites, but for Story Time from Space, you go there. And, and then, yeah, check out the global warming, because it's, I mean, you can't ignore it, it's all over the, well, I mean, I read science blogs, it's all over the science blogs, it's all over the place, the new climate change report. Uh, this is science impacting our lives right now. Uh, so check that out and, and check out Jeff's video. And it's especially meant for people who might not be sure what to believe. So right. hopefully you mm -hmm. can pass it on to your friends who say they have questions about it. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank Perfect. you so, so much for joining us this thank week. You. Thank you. Jeff has been fantastic. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, everyone, for watching. This is this week's episode of Learning Space. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Oh, shoot.